Yesterday, J.J. Reddick fired the F-bomb heard round the world. At his introductory press conference as the Lakers' new coach, J.J. Reddick fired off an F-bomb. I'm going to connect that F-bomb to the 1960s fearsome foursome defensive line. I'm going to connect it to Joe Burrow. I'm going to connect it to Travis Kelsey. I'm going to connect it to Bill Belichick. We have a new fearsome foursome, the F-bomb foursome. Stay tuned. I'm going to connect the dots today. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy Tuesday. We have an awesome show planned for you today. Uh, TJ Moe is going to be with me here in studio. Uh, Steve Kim's going to join us via Skype. Uh, we're going to deliver a fantastic show. Uh, before we do that, I want to thank you guys that are Blaze TV subscribers and remind you guys that are Blaze TV subscribers, you can get that extra fearless content. Uh, because you're a Blaze TV subscriber. If you want to see me and Shamika Michelle break down Jamal Bowman and AOC making fools of themselves in the Bronx, all you got to do is be a Blaze TV subscriber. Go to blazetv.com backslash fearless. Use the promo code fearless, and you can save $20 on your yearly subscription. Please do that uh, right now. And the other thing you can always do is thank our great friends, our good friends at Good Ranchers, uh, go to GoodRanchers.com, use my promo code FEARLESS, and with your subscription, you can claim $100 off plus free smoked brats for a year while supporting veterans this Independence Day. It's time to revolt and claim your independence from the grocery store meat aisle. All right, uh, let's get into today's show. Uh, we've got a couple of different topics. I want to, several topics, but I'm going to connect them all together. We're going to start with J.J. Reddick. And then we're going to bring Joe Burrow into it. Then we're going to bring Travis Kelsey into it. Then we're going to bring Bill Belichick into it. And at some point along the way, I'm going to tell you how this all connects to Rosie Greer and Lamar Lundy, the fearsome force. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's start with uh, J.J. Reddick and the F-bomb heard around the world yesterday. Uh, he here's J.J. Reddick, the ESPN broadcaster, the LeBron James podcaster, now the head coach of one of the most iconic sports franchises in the history of American sports. He's at his introductory press conference, and he's letting the F-bombs fly. Let's watch. What misconceptions or concerns about you that you've heard in the last few weeks are you the most like looking forward to dispelling when you're the coach? Um, it's a valid question. And I've certainly heard everything. Um, you know, it's it's been a really interesting uh, six weeks or so, um, just in terms of uh, you know being part of the engagement farming uh, industry. You know, it's been really interesting. Um, however, I, I I don't really have a great answer for your uh, question because I, I really don't give a f like honestly. <laughs> I want to coach the Lakers. I want to coach the team. I don't want to dispel anything. I don't. I want to become a great coach in the NBA, and I want to win championships, and I want my players to maximize their careers. That's all I f care about. I don't know if you could hear it in the background, but you know, someone was say saying how much they loved that. They were taking them back, but they loved it, and it was great. No, it wasn't. J.J. Reddick at an introductory press conference dropping an F-bomb, it it's, speaks to everything that we have going on in American culture and society. Men are failing to be leaders. Men are followers. Men are being emasculated. Men don't understand their responsibilities, their role, in this society to not just set an example, but to be genuine leaders. J.J. Reddick uh, is getting a job he has no qualifications for, none. 
He hasn't earned it. He's being given a job because of his relationship with LeBron James. There have been other coaches before him that have gotten positions and jobs they don't deserve. I'm not claiming any sort of white privilege for J.J. Redick. I'm not claiming any of that. What I am claiming is he lives in a world and a society where we have eliminated qualifications and everything is just handed out and given and men don't have to embrace leadership or proper behavior because everything's just handed out. When there is no meritocracy, no one cares about merit. When there is no meritocracy, no one cares about uh, conducting themselves in a professional manner. No one cares about the example they're setting for young people. Re re let's remember, the coaching profession at its heart, at its foundation, was about men discipling, leading young people through athletics. As I've explained to you all on this show, things that no one knows anything about anymore is like organized sports. They were organized by the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. This was about discipling young people. J.J. Reddick doesn't care anything about that. He just said, a horrible example for young people, and he does not care. And many of you don't care. Oh, Jason, you're just, you've gone too far with this Christian thing. You got a pole up your rear end, you're uptight. Hey, I, I, I try not to curse at all, but I still struggle with cursing. I, I, and there was a time when I could curse with the very best of them and took pride took great satisfaction in my ability to curse with the best of them. MF was my favorite word. I used it as a term of endearment. But when you really get the scales taken off your eyes, you understand uh, how stupid you are, how limited you are, and how irresponsible you are by presenting yourself in such a profane fashion time and time and time again. And to do this at an introductory press conference is ridiculous. It serves no purpose. Bobby Knight wouldn't do this. Not at an introductory press conference. He wouldn't be allowed to, and he just wouldn't do it. You have one chance to make a first impression. You, you remember when your parents used to tell you that or adults used to tell that, hey, you got one chance to make a first impression, make it a good one. If J.J. Redick, after a tough loss, after a, a, a long press conference where he's been asked a bunch of different questions and he's in the middle of a season and he's distracted and he's frustrated because there's all these other issues going on and he lets fly with, a prof with some profanity, no one cares. But when you're suited up, sitting next to your alleged boss, uh, at an introductory press conference, you should present yourself in the most professional way possible. But men have abandoned our post, our responsibility. We've bought into all the lies told about us. F the patriarchy. Remember that? that that's, let me start connecting these dots of Travis Kelsey sitting out here with his girlfriend, uh, Taylor Swift, as she's chant leading the crowd in F the Patriarchy, and he's bringing her out into, uh, on stage and helping her disrobe in front of an audience. This is Travis Kelsey, NFL superstar tight end, headed to the Hall of Fame. He's now part of the uh, Taylor Swift PSYOP, the Taylor Swift uh, F the Patriarchy, Patriarchy PSYOP. The whole feminist movement, the whole, everything is about sexuality. Everything is about sexual identity. This is men abandoning their responsibilities to be leaders, to set an example, to set a tone for the society and culture. And, and as I go to, and I'm going to deal with, be patient, 
I'm going to deal with, because I know many of you are sitting out there, what about Donald Trump? I'm going to deal with that. Because that also is part of the problem. It's not the main part, but it's part of the problem, and I will deal with that. But I'm, right now, I'm just sticking to what we're seeing in sports. J.J. Reddick, head coach of an iconic sports franchise. First impression, F-bombs come right out his mouth. Travis Kelsey, superstar NFL tight end, headed to the Hall of Fame, worth $100, $200 million. He gets partnered with Taylor Swift to be a part of the feminist movement. Joe Burrow, did y'all see this? Joe Burrow, the quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals, the LSU superstar that led him to the national championship, won a Heisman Trophy. He's the next Joe Cool. I guess he is the next Broadway Joe. He, he's gone full uh, Joe Namath. Have you all seen this? Uh, Joe Burrow walking a runway in Paris in a uh, suit, a backless suit. They've dressed this man up like a woman. They've dressed this man up like a woman. Look at that outfit from behind. That is a woman's outfit. And the quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals, one of the biggest stars in the NFL, yeah, sign me up, I'll do that. I'll fly over to Paris and let y'all parade me around as a woman. Cam Newton is somewhere laughing, like <laughs> Whitlock had a problem with my hats and my hairstyle. Whitlock had a problem with the bonnet I was wearing on my head. Joe Burrow's out here in a backless suit, dressed up like a woman. The man, how much money has he made in the NFL? How, how much attention and fame? What, what more does he need? When will men ever be satisfied and not, oh, I got to have more attention. I've got to do more hey, look at me stuff. The more, 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 more. When do men say, you know what, I'm good. I'm a football player, I make a lot of money, I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm not the guy that needs to push the sexual uh, identity, the sexuality envelope. We've abandoned our post. We haven't drawn a line in the sand. We are so controlled by, and again, all of this is because, again, the words that came out of uh, J.J. Reddick's mouth are sexual. The F-bomb. That's a sexual word. We're so, we, we've been so baited into a pornographic, obscene mindset. We, we've been so perverted that what comes out of our mouth and our actions and the way we present ourselves, all of it has a sexual connotation. All of it. None of it is attached to a responsibility to set a tone and to be leaders and to set an example for young people. Let me throw another guy in there, Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick, 72 years old, the most iconic coach perhaps in all of sports. Maybe Red Arbach's on his level. Uh, Vince Lombardi, I guess, is on his level, level. His name's on the trophy. But in terms of accomplishments, Bill Belichick, all those Super Bowl titles, an impeccable reputation, 72 years old. Now he's parading around with a 24-year-old, looking like a creepy old man. He's, this is his out in public side piece, or not even a side piece anymore. This is his out in public. This is his main squeeze that he's running around with publicly. A 48-year age gap. This woman is young enough to be his granddaughter. And as I told you previously, Clearly, anybody that knows me knows I like young women. But children? That, I'm when you're 72, that is a child. I don't care how, she's 24, she's old enough, she's graduated from college. No, that, that, that's, that's a child to a 72-year-old. 
period, end of story. And so instead of uh, the fearsome force, I mean, you go back to the 1960s, men, and again, look, I'm not putting any of these guys I'm about to reference on any sort of pedestal. I'm not putting uh, Rosie Greer, Lamar Lundy, Merlin Olson, Deacon Jones. I'm not putting the fearsome foursome on some type of pedestal. I'm sure they had their demons. I'm sure they had their secrets. I'm sure they were just as flawed as everybody else. But there was an image that they wanted to project of masculinity, of strength, of character. And we've thrown all of that out the window. Men don't want to be fearsome. We don't want the responsibility of leadership. We don't want the responsibility of setting examples, setting a tone, making sure the culture is safe for young people. We don't want that responsibility. We think, hey, let kids experience it all. Let's expose them to everything. If J.J. Reddick wants to curse and scream at an opening press conference and set that tone, have at it. If Travis Kelsey wants to go help Taylor Swift disrobe on stage, have at it. If Joe Burrow wants to dress up like a woman in Paris, have at it. And if Bill Belichick wants to please his penis with a 24-year-old, have at it. Let the kids know everything. Uh, we've moved away from, and, and <clears throat> it sounds like, but John Thompson, the legendary college basketball coach, used to say when he was alive that, you know, you should have three lives, a private life, a public life, and a personal life. We've removed all everybody wants now is a public life. Everything is for content. Everything is for viral activity. Everything is about building a social media brand. And, and, and I'm just, look, there were probably NFL quarterbacks in the 1960s and 70s who liked to put on women's clothes in their private life. Have at it. Do whatever you want to do in your private life. Be wise enough to know that setting that type of public tone, setting that out there is like normalizing that behavior. There are consequences for that. We have a very chaotic, dysfunctional society because everybody wants to live out their sexual fantasies publicly for everybody to consume. Our kids, young people, are in danger because of it. it, it I'm just if Joe Burrow, in the comfort of his 17,000 square foot, 24,000 square foot home, whatever he's living in, if he wants to dress up in women's clothes inside his home, I would never complain. If J.J. Reddick, mid-season, loses his temper and drops an F-bomb in a press conference, I wouldn't say a word. If Travis Kelsey, in, in whatever compound or 150-acre home that uh, uh, Taylor Swift has, if he wants to un help her undress inside that compound, for her pleasure, his pleasure, and I wouldn't care if they invited family and friends over. That's their business. If Bill Belichick, if he wants a sugar baby, what's, I, what's the name of the site? Ashley Madison? Is that still around? Have at it, Bill. But all of this public all of this just out there and normalizing it and setting a tone and, and taking this culture and society further and farther and further down the pornographic sexual path that, that we have normalized. There are consequences for that. Kids are not safe. They're being groomed. 
teachers are coming into class. They're not teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. They're having conversations about how they spent their summer with whoever they're sleeping with. They're having conversations with kids about their own personal life and wanting to talk about some uh, fourth grader or third grader or second grader's sexual identity. None of this stuff is appropriate. Mo all of it needs to be left to parents, not teachers. It's, did, did we, I don't know if we played the clip. I know I showed the clip. There was a clip of Mina Kimes and uh, Dominique Foxworth. And I, I wish, I don't think I gave that to Justin. It, it may be on my Twitter feed. I don't know if you guys can find it before I run out. To, well, we'll get to it at some point, but today we'll, we'll hunt it up and find it. Uh, but <clears throat> Mina Kimes and Dominique Foxworth having a conversation about where it appeared like Dominique Foxworth seemed to be saying like, hey man, I don't have to talk to my kids about transgenderism and all this other stuff because, uh, you know, pop culture, uh, the school system, social media, they're all educating them on all these different sexual identities and now I don't have to do it. He, he, was, he seemed to be bragging about this, seemed to be well pleased that, hey, I don't have to teach my kids all these uh, 32 sexual identities that the world has said we have. I don't have to do that anymore because th there's a rap song about it. And so now they know. Whew, load off my shoulders. I don't have to tell my kids about transgenderism. I don't have to tell my kids about gay sex. It's on all the TV shows. This is the insane world that we're building. And I blame men. I, I look at the F-bomb foursome, the F-boy foursome. I go, what are we doing? And, I, and I, I'm just using them as examples. I'm not saying like they're personally responsible, but they do represent the path we're headed on. All men, we're all headed down that path. Because again, not, not enough of us are objecting, not enough of us are saying enough is enough. What are you doing? You, you, we're allowing this. And, and this, this type of behavior, from J.J. Reddick to Joe Burrow to Travis Kelsey to Bill Belichick, it's all being rewarded. I, 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 people won't understand, I just sound like an old man shouting, oh, Whitlock's just all uptight. I like Whitlock better when he used to hang out at strip clubs. And someone will hop on my Twitter feed and they'll show me, they'll post pictures of me at some nightclub with women sitting on my lap. And, and, and like I'm, haven't already copped to all of that. What I'm telling you is there's consequences for that, and we're living in those consequences. This, the, the F boys, the F boy foursome. At some point, we have to say enough is enough. I, I look across the sports world, and, and we used to hold up these guys as some sort of example, some sort of standard to be reached. And, and maybe we were wrong for that. Clearly, we were. Clearly, we were wrong for that. But to see him go this other direction, this hard, all of them, mind blowing to me. <clears throat> all right. Uh, we'll bring on uh, TJ Mo and uh, Steve Kim here in a moment to talk about that. And I also have a little conversation I want to have with uh, Steve Kim about some comments uh, Stephen A. Smith has made that basically, you know, white people just need to shut up and stand down as black folks' business and the, the level of racism we've just kind of legalized at ESPN, mind blowing to me. Before I do that, uh, I want to talk to you guys about Covenant Eyes. There are a lot of companies out there working against you, your marriage or your family. You've heard about them on this show, but here's one company that is on your side, our friends at Covenant Eyes. 
Covenant Eyes has been the number one trusted software for 23 years for Christians seeking to live a porn-free life. I know pornography isn't, easy, isn't an easy topic to talk about, hear about, but it must be discussed. It's a silent killer. Porn is damaging marriages, families, and impacting the work of the church by holding people hostage to this secret sin. Maybe you've experienced this in your life or seen this in the life of someone you love. Victory by Covenant Eyes is a powerful tool that helps Christians who are serious and want to quit porn for good or never start. Victory combines industry-leading technology with decades of experience and leadership in recovery content, accountability, and behavioral change. Scripture teaches us the importance of being accountable. Proverbs 27 and 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. James 5 and 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Once installed, the Victory app runs silently in the background of your devices and uses cutting edge AI technology to watch the screen for behavior that doesn't match your goals. Next, you will invite a trusted friend to be your ally. This is someone that can walk beside you through the ups and downs of recovery. Your ally will get push notifications of any porn use and reminders to have accountability conversations even if everything is going well. Living a porn-free life will bring you a new freedom to live honestly and remember accountability is not others calling you out on your sin, but others calling you up to the person you are in Christ. So what are you waiting for? Anyone can get started on their path to recovery for free by visiting CovenantEyes.com and using my promo code FEARLESS for 30 days free or by clicking on the link in the show notes today. Uh, TJ Mo, Steve Kim, next. like how we are backwards in society that you are now castigated as a parent of any race, creed, and color that if you're at the park and all of a sudden there's this freak show going on that if you tell your little girl, hey, hey, honey, honey, get away from that man waving that dildo like a Luke Skywalker side, uh, uh, a lightsaber. The force is strong. In this one. And then all of a sudden, like, people question you. Like, you literally don't have the right to tell your own kids that, look, if people are doing that, I'm going to take you out of school. You're not going to be going to that classroom. People that do not like gay, I mean, they're good. Welcome back to Beef. As I walk you through uh, my top 50 media beefs of all time. Yeah, I'm an equal opportunity beefer. It's like, Randy, are you asleep at the wheel? Big lips are in style. I'd love to squash this beef. I mean, I was not real happy at all. I, I, I was less than thrilled. I was displeased. And now we have beef. For 10 years, Patriot Mobile has been America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. And when I say only, trust me, they're the only one. Founder Glenn Story and his team have been great supporters of this show, which is why I'm proud to partner with them. Patriot Mobile offers dependable nationwide coverage, giving you the ability to access all three major networks, which means you get the same coverage you've been accustomed to without funding the left. When you switch to Patriot Mobile, you're sending the message that you support free speech, religious freedom, the sanctity of life, the Second Amendment, and our military veterans and first responders. Their 100% U.S.-based customer service team makes switching easy. Keep your number, keep your phone, or upgrade. Their team will help you find the best plan for your needs. Just go to patriotmobile.com slash Jason or call 972-PATRIOT. Get free activation when you use the offer code Jason. Join me. Make the switch today. patriotmobile.com slash Jason. That's patriotmobile.com slash Jason or call 972-PATRIOT. All right, welcome back. Uh, Steve Kim, TJ Mo. Uh, TJ joining me here in studio. Steve Kim uh, joining us via Skype. Uh, gentlemen, uh, big news, little news, or no news. 
J.J. Reddick dropping an F-bomb at his introductory press conference. Steve, I know you got a salty mouth. Uh, we'll start with you. Big news, little news, or no news? Funny news. I, I was amused. It really was. Um, and I love the fact that old Peter Vesey came up with the new moniker, Ridiculous. J.J. Ridiculous. I cannot wait for the coverage. And look, this is almost like he became like the preppy version of John Kreese. And for those of you who are a little bit younger, John Kreese was the villainous leader of the Cobra Kai, of uh, the Karate Kid, which just celebrated its 40th year from release. All-time great movie. Um, but I do understand the argument. Look, I'm a guy that enjoys fiery press conferences and coaches who don't go by the script. And when they start using expletives, I get it. Some people aren't going to like it. Uh, I actually find these things to be humorous. They can become quite iconic. Uh, but I do understand this other argument, though. Many of those outbursts happen after the heat of the moment of a game. Okay, I'm willing to admit that in a controlled environment like a press conference to introduce you as the leader of this team... I do understand that there should be some decorum, but Jason, come on. You didn't love some of the stuff Mike Ditka used to do. You didn't like it when Jerry Burns, or oh, flat out when Alfred Anderson lost his shoe and he just went on this cussing brigade for five minutes. And one of the funniest moments, one of the most iconic moments in L.A. sports history, Dave Kingman hits three home runs, has like eight RBIs against the Dodgers, and Paul Olden asked, uh, Tommy, what did you think about Kingman's performance? And Lasorda just said, what the f do you think is my, of his three home runs, eight? It was great. To this day, we still talk about it. So I, I don't know. It's just sports. It's just basketball. But, at the, uh, but again, on the flip side, I do understand setting an atmosphere is important. TJ? I hated it. I'm trying to find, uh, let's see, he's, <clears throat> it's a four-year deal in the neighborhood of $8 million. You're paying this guy $8 million to... Per year? Uh, no, yeah, per season. Yeah. $8 oh, million wow. dollars per year, it looks like, according to Yahoo. And, you know, I think you should have a level of self-respect and respect for the people who just hired you. You have guys like Colin Cowherd, who I like less every day, saying, look, I love when you make people uncomfortable. It was the first thing he tweeted out yesterday. Guys, just deal with it. He makes people uncomfortable. I love it. I'm like, the only people that he's making uncomfortable are the Lakers ex executives who now have to sit there and say, what did we just do? Because this guy has no respect for one of the most storied programs, storied franchises in the history of sports, that you, your job, particularly as a... Boston and LA, those are your two teams that are the face of the NBA. You're trying to market to as many people as possible, a bunch of six-year-olds that you hope to be 40 and 50-year fans. And you know how many parents are gonna say, I can't watch a J.J. Reddick press conference now. We can't have this. And so, the coach is forever. I mean, this is, I'm going back to my high school coach, right? Behind closed doors, when you get angry, you say some things. But front-facing, you always are buttoned up. Always, when you talk to the media, there's a level of respect to everyone, not just the people watching, but to yourself, to your players, to everybody involved in your program, because you want people to think that we care about what's going on here. We're going to put our best foot forward and present ourselves in the best possible way. And J.J. Redick blew that up on day one. Cowherd said make people uncomfortable, that that's the... the, the sta come, I mean, I, I got to hear. I didn't, I didn't see this. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's the job of a head coach to make fan bases or fans uncomfortable. He may want to make uh, his players uncomfortable. Maybe there's some people in the organization that he wants to make uncomfortable, but just doing stuff to make people uncomfortable. I, I, what's, what's the direct well, quote here? What's uh, 16 hours ago, love it when people make others uncomfortable, deal with it. His mission is on point. I love it when people Wow. I'm not sure if that's accurate. And again, I yeah. like Colin Cowherd. I enjoyed my work experience with him. But making people but, uncomfortable is not what Colin Cowherd wanted to do. Uh, well, yeah. Anytime we talked Jason, about Colin Kaepernick or anything like that, he was yeah, trying I mean, to spread Jason, as much comfort as possible. <laughs> I, I mean, Jason, if Reddick was black, he could have been unapologetically J.J. Reddick. But, you know, I, one of the great press conference moments of all time, T.J., and I think you were probably – I don't even know if you were born at this point. I, I'll never forget 
It was March or April of 1994, the great James William Johnson departs the Cowboys. Him and Jerry Jones have that splitting up. 48 hours later, Barry Switzer gets introduced as the Cowboy coach. And I'll never forget. <laughs> you got to look this up on YouTube. So they're introducing Barry Switzer, and Jerry Jones is right next to him. And Barry gave one of the all-time great sound bites. He goes, we got a job to do. Oh, we got to get it done, baby. And he just slaps Jerry Jones on the back. And Jerry Jones had this look like, oh, oh boy. Oh, boy. I hope this team is good enough to <laughs> overcome this guy. But it was funny. But you're right. You're right, though, TJ. He kept the language clean. He kept it clean for the kids. I will give him that. I can't believe you're not referencing Hal McCray in the Kansas City Royals. When you start talking about 1994, heat I think of the that game. was when Hal McCray snapped. Right, but yeah. that's the heat of a game. That is after a game yeah. that they lost, and then when he swung the telephone, he cut that guy. But again, I, I, I will yeah. I'll admit this. Most of your coaches' outbursts are about the heat of the game. And to TJ's point, yes. when you're in a setting like that, it's much more relaxed. You know, uh, one of the all-time great press conference coaches was Jim Mora. Playoffs? Pl playoffs? You kidding me? <laughs> or the other one? We couldn't run the ball. We couldn't pass the ball. We couldn't do diddly poo. I mean, again, TJ, he kept it clean for the kids, though. Well, and, and look, Nick Saban, his, his most famous of all time, is losing to Louisiana Monroe, I think it was. And he said, they ran through us like blank through a tin horn, right? And it's memorable, <laughs> probably not the thing that he would point to and say, that was my best moment. You just had one of your worst losses ever. And you thought, hey, I just went from LSU's uh, national championship winning coach, I'm trying to recover from Miami debacle, and that just happened to me at Alabama. So there are times where, like, I actually, I don't mind the texture. I don't, I don't mind you getting angry. I think you should try to be professional. You're, you're getting paid millions of dollars. I get it, we're playing a sport, but it's still a business. I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of people in these organizations relying on this job. Okay, Jason. as the only parent in this conference, hold on for a second, Steve. Yeah. TJ's the only parent in this conversation. Uh, and so there will be some people like what I'm saying, hey, man, you got to set an example for the kids. And oh, oh, here he goes with, what about the kids? You know, the kids, they're already exposed to this. They listen to Cardi B. They listen to Not my Snoop kids. Dogg. They blah, blah, blah. Just as a parent and just as a father and, and as someone that, again, I'm sure will disciple your kids in sports, I... I Coaches, and again, this is why I don't like the J.J. Reddick hire, because he's doing this because the opportunity is there, not because he planned to be a coach and has some kind of reverence for coaches, given much thought to, you know, he's a guy that's starting at the very top. This isn't a guy that, hey, I was coaching junior high kids, and now I'm coaching high school kids, blah, blah, blah. But just what do you think of my argument like – this is a coach, and he's coming out the gate setting this type of example for young people? Yeah, I, exactly right. I mean, what you would hope to do, particularly because your kids probably didn't watch J.J. Redick play ball, is my guess. And so there is no, like, history of just watching him mature and come through as a Duke guy. And, and so the, the rest of us have a little bit of background. So this is how J.J. is. You leave him alone. You like to be able to point to head coaches and say, hey, listen to what that guy says. It's in, what he's saying is important. You should always listen to your coaches. They're gonna be teaching you life lessons. They're going to be, hopefully, I mean, Nick Saban's the best at this. He, he'll be preaching something at the media that he's trying to tell his players. And a lot of the best coaches do that. And so, you know, you, you see this sort of thing. We're just not gonna watch the press conferences in my house. It's like, look, I can't trust J.J. Redick to not say something ridiculous that my kids are gonna repeat when they're six years old. <laughs> I'm not doing it. So we're not gonna hear anything J.J. Redick has to say. And I, I get it, everybody I've ever heard make the argument that you're making, doesn't have kids. I used to do radio with a couple guys, a former NHL guy, Cam Jansen used to make that argument all the time. And this is before I had kids. And I'm like, Cam, yeah, you know, I love you, buddy, but you're an idiot in this area. I, I don't know what to tell you. There, there are no, the, I don't know anybody with kids who wants to subject their children to this type of language at an early age. Why would you want that? I, I gotta say, even as an adult, it's like my expectations for a press conference when I saw this, I was like, he said this at an opening press conference? My expectations just, I was kind of shocked and taken aback, like, wow, this is a really unprofessional look. And to me, it screams, and Steve, I'm going to bring you back here, it, it, it yeah. screams insecurity to me. 
It, it, it's, it comes across like, oh, this guy just got a job he doesn't deserve. And, and he's, he's already, you know, like in over his head and he doesn't want to have to answer this. I don't give a F about them, blah, blah. <laughs> it sounded very insecure to me, well, Steve. Let's take a look at what J.J. Reddick is. He's a very intelligent guy, but there's no doubt there's some real smugness to him. And to TJ's point about Reddick, he truly is the archetype of the unlikable preppy Duke ball player. Okay, so that's strike one. The other thing is when he disrespected the past players and basically calling them unathletic plumbers. And I remember Jerry West, who generally kept it very PC, said, who is this guy to say anything about the past players that laid the groundwork for this league? I mean, you could really see in that soundbite that I sent to you a couple weeks ago, Jason, how agitated the logo was, and God rest his soul. And then number three, I, this is going to be really interesting because he seemed to dismiss what I thought was a pretty interesting question, that if this thing does not go well, okay, how is he going to deal with the media? I mean, because he was already talking about people in the media, talking about content providers or farmers, and he seemed to be very dismissive. And I wonder how his relationship with the media is going to be when he gets asked some tough questions. So, again, that, that's going to be interesting. But, Jason, one other great press conference moment that I know you loved. Come on, you had to get a chuckle out of it. When John Calipari was talking about something, then all of a sudden the old Temple Owl, John Chaney, goes, What? I'll kill you, man. <laughs> Tell me that was not amusing to you. Come on, Jason. <laughs> It was amusing, but it's not. The, again, that's after a game, after a yeah, loss, he's people the are fired up. He's the moment. It, it, it's yeah. <laughs> he, he's the but. So the the phrase he used, I think, Steve, was engagement farming, yeah. which right. I think is what he's doing here. He acted like he moved on from the podcast shock jock thing, where hey, I need to get views. I'm doing this thing with LeBron. I need people to listen. I got to say crazy things. This is no different, except you don't engagement farm when you're the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> Well, you've won the race. You've, yeah. you, you, you oh, again. You've cut in line. You've done everything possible. You've gotten elevated to again the top coaching position in all of professional basketball. You don't have the resume for it. You, you got elevated to the top broadcasting spot in all of professional basketball. You don't have the resume for it. And and unfor he doesn't understand. It's like he's taking a shot at Stephen A. Smith. Let let's cut to the chase. He. He, he, he and Stephen A. Smith battled on first take. Stephen A. Smith has been critical uh, in a very sly way about this hire. And so the engagement farming, he's talking about first take and Stephen A. Smith. But the issue is J.J. Reddick knows nothing about proper journalism. Nothing. He, he, and, and primarily because his entry into sports journalism was through first take. <laughs> All he knows is engagement farming. That's why he reverted to it on day one as the head basketball coach of the most prestigious franchise in the NBA. He, he, he reverted to what he knows. Guys. I, this is a uh, – go ahead. One last point, Jason. Did you find it insulting – that everyone there tried to make it sound like LeBron had no say in this process, that somehow <laughs> Reddick doing this show with LeBron was not a foreshadowing to, hey, that's going to, I mean, literally from the time he did that show, everyone kind of knew like, oh, we know where this is going. And for, for everyone to say, well, LeBron had nothing to do, really, really, okay. I found that to be more alarming Let's than the F-bomb, to be honest with you. Let's let's play the clip of J.J. Redick uh, addressing that, saying he and LeBron never talked until, until after the job was about the job until after it was offered. Play the clip. That you have a very close relationship with LeBron. He could have done a podcast with anybody in the world. He chose to do it with you. What was his advice to you throughout this whole coaching search process? He didn't provide any advice. Um, LeBron and I did not talk about uh, the Lakers job. Uh, until Thursday afternoon, uh, about 30 minutes after I was offered the job. Uh, and that was very intentional on both our parts. Um, you know, I, I knew I had an understanding that he did not want to be involved in this. Um, and for me, I didn't want to go down the path of hypotheticals uh, with someone that I consider a friend and, and someone that I have a, a great amount of respect for. So 
for 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 us it, it just came down to literally thursday afternoon and and i talked to him for about 15 20 minutes and got off the phone that was it <laughs> it's that level of dishonesty just blatant dishonesty yeah. is is mind blowing because he's i don't can't say he was angling for the lakers job but he's been angling for an nba head coaching job for well more than a year i pointed this out uh, there was something he defended uh, the players doing or some player doing, and I was like, oh, my God, J.J. Redick wants to be yeah. an NBA head coach, that, that he's using ESPN to put himself in position to be an NBA head coach. And, and this is where, I mean, ESPN, they don't care, and, and, you know, but they should be halfway embarrassed. A guy that that they paid, I'm sure, a substantial amount of money, never at any point was there serving ESPN. He was always serving his own interest. And that's what ESPN has gotten into bed with over and over and over and over again over the last decade is that everybody's there just to use ESPN. No one's actually there to serve ESPN primarily. Everybody, Pat McAfee, Stephen A. Smith, everybody's just trying to build something different, bigger, independent of ESPN. Jamel Hill wanted to launch her political career. Stephen A. Smith wants to launch his political career. I I just couldn't imagine being uh, a primary employer that allow, that pays people really significant sums of money that allow them to have an agenda well outside of doing what's best for the main person paying you. I, I, I just saw something the other day where Stephen A. Smith is, is uh, already talking about some nightly uh, political show or weekly political show he wants to do. And I'm like, didn't I just read a story they offered him $18 million a year from ESPN? Mm-hmm. How could this guy be somewhere talking about doing something else other than the $18 million? That, that's what blows my mind about all of this. I found uh, what you're talking about. It was when he went on his rant against those who were critical of John Morant's off-the-court gun issues. There you go. Yes. The guy didn't he, he found a way to try to defend John Morant. Yes. And I was like, the guy wants to be an NBA head yeah. coach. We thought He's it was butt. Toronto at the time. We thought he was. He was that's what, anyway, so uh, to your point, didn't they learn their lesson? Because you actually identified this in... 2009 maybe I think I heard you talking about it that this sort of thing is what helped put newspapers out of business yes when the Kansas City Star allowed you to work at ESPN too they're like you guys are idiots and now ESPN's doing the same thing allowing everybody to do their own podcast and use it as a stepping stool to something else they're gonna put themselves out of business there's an arrogance I watched it in the newspaper business there's an arrogance because I started writing for page two, early 2000s, and, and I was like, oh wow, the star's gonna let me do this. And, and it, it was crazy, and, but I was appreciative, <laughs> and, and I had, but the, the, the clearest day, that this is the honest to God truth, I never wanted to leave the newspaper industry. Never wanted to leave. I wanted to be the Mike Royko of sports, I wanted some 40, 50 year in Kansas City, but they just kept making so many stupid decisions and, and losing, all, I, 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 you got me off on a tangent, but, but cause here was the other crazy thing that like the mentality, the arrogance that these media platforms have. I can, this is in the nineties I started pointing out, early nineties, uh, sports writers and local newspapers, man, I ain't going to ask no high school kid what college he wants to go to. I'm not doing that. That's beneath me. Re- and covering recruiting was beneath sports writers. <laughs> and I kept saying, well, hold on, man. If fans are interested in it, you should, because they are. What? Hey, where Jeff George or where, whoever the big high school talent is, where he's in, fans are interested. Give them that information. Th- that's our job to serve sports fans and what they're interested in. And I can remember, I can remember before Rivals was Rivals, I was like, if a newspaper just leaned into recruiting, 
they could they could have built a recruiting website, a recruiting deal platform. And I was like, and so Rivals did it, sold it for a hundred million dollars. I was like, is there some newspaper that I'm not aware of that doesn't need a hundred million dollars? <laughs> is there, are there some? But but that's the mentality of the media. There's there's such an incredible arrogance that we get to decide what's important. The people don't decide, and they make decisions that end up killing themselves. And we're watching it in real time with ESPN. There's a couple more things I want to get to in this conversation, but before I do that, I want to uh, talk to you guys about uh, the 4th of July and how good ranchers can help. This 4th of July, claim your independence from the meat aisle. Prices are up, quality is down in the store, and there are more imports than ever. It's time to revolt. GoodRanchers.com is the number one place to get 100% American meat for uniquely American holidays. Celebrate the sweet taste of freedom with savory meats conveniently delivered right to your door, and they're all born, raised, and made right here in the U.S. of A. Whether you're hosting a backyard barbecue, a poolside party, or a beach bonfire, Good Ranchers has you covered. In fact, right now you can save on Good Ranchers meat like never before. Subscribe to any Good Ranchers box now and get $100 off plus free smoke brats for a year. It's more than just a great deal. It's a chance to celebrate America by supporting American family farms and enjoying the highest quality American meat. All you have to do to claim this offer is go to GoodRanchers.com, subscribe to any of their custom curated boxes filled with 100% American beef, chicken, pork, or wild-caught seafood. Use my promo code FEARLESS at checkout to claim your $100 off and free smoke brats for a year. Get free shipping on all of your orders and make this Independence Day one to remember. If you needed any other reason to support Good Ranchers, they're not only amazing partners for my show, but they support the paralyzed veterans of Americans too. Every, other, every order saves American farms and supports American veterans. Change the way you buy meat today at GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to claim your $100 off plus free brats for a year. Make this Independence Day unforgettable with food that brings everyone together and flavors that honor the spirit of America. GoodRanchers.com. American meat delivered. Steve, TJ, uh, I want to do a contrast, a comparison between JJ. I want you all, JJ Reddick. I'm going to start with you, TJ. JJ Reddick, Travis Kelsey, Joe Burrow, <laughs> and Bill Belichick. Who's got the worst look of those four? Uh, it, it, it's this is tough for me. I'm going to vote first and <laughs> say. Joe Burrow in the woman's dress suit or whatever he's in, that's probably got my crown at the moment. I'm shocked by this. Well, I'm, I'm just shocked. Well, you can put him next to virtually any NBA player and they all look just as ridiculous. I, back out. I'm just a, a suit with a back out. Have you seen Cam Newton's hair at any point this decade? <laughs> I mean, I just, there are a lot of ways to look ridiculous. I, yes, I wouldn't put my back out, but I wouldn't dress like that, uh, my hair like that either. I would say there's nothing more emasculating you could possibly do than what Travis Kelsey's doing right now. That is the worst possible look. He, that dude would give up every ounce of his testosterone to be Taylor Swift's little punk the rest of his life. Mm, uh, Steve, is there any of these look worse than the rest? Well, with Bill Belichick, he wouldn't be on my list. He's just like a lot of other football coaches and going through a youth movement. Congratulations to you, old Billy boy. I didn't know you had that in you. I wasn't familiar with your game. Um, the thing with Burrow, that does not surprise me. Just cleaning out that roster. He's sal yeah. salary cap dump, the whole nine. Just youth every, movement. every year there's a I new first-round draft choice. You know, I just hit it, picked it up on the waiver wire. All right, but anyway, um, I actually have a name that I think is more disgusting than all of them, if you want to get to it. Uh, but I will say this about yeah. Joe Burrow. You are a boring, white, suburban kid. What is wrong with being that? In the last couple of years, Jason, I know we've talked about it. He tries to come in with all the, quote, what the kids call the drip, the swag. And I'm just like, what are you doing? And now he does this, and I'm like, oh, God. I, it's not a good sign. But I have a name that's more disgusting than all these guys. And I, I'm actually outraged by it. Steve Kerr. Guys, uh, Jason, we talked about him a couple weeks ago. He wants to go on this gun control rant, right? Well, I'm looking at these stories where in the area where he coaches, the Bay Area, 
Oakland has become the OK Corral. And over that fine unifying holiday, Juneteenth, this thing is, is acting like the Battle of Midway, right? Where out thou, Shang Tao, that crouching tiger mayor? Um, a lot of stuff's going on in Oakland, a lot of violent crime, a lot of shootings, gunplay. Steve Kerr does not say a word. Where are you now as the activist? If you care about gun control and safety of the public, why not start in the area where you're employed? Uh, good take, particularly there was a lot of shooting in Oakland during Juneteenth or whatever it, it was. The Oakland's mayor just got her house raided. Now, Oakland's having all sorts of problems yeah, right they now. They got all yeah, you know, we, we, Yeah, but you know, Jason, and, you know what they call that in Oakland where there's a lot of gunplay? A day that ends in Y, anyway. <laughs> I thought you were going to. I thought you were going to go there. Uh, Steve, TJ, I want to move on to uh, Stephen A. Smith. Uh, give you a little daily dose of Stephen A. Smith. Uh, Stephen A. Uh, in his J.J. Reddick conversation, and he went into this deal about how black coaches called him that were upset that J.J. was on a podcast. And anyway, Steve, Stephen A. took some blowback for that and has now come out and issued another statement where he basically says uh, Whitey should just mind his own business. Let's play the clip. Black coaches called the black commentator to complain about a black superstar doing a podcast while his black head coach was on the hot seat before he ultimately lost the damn job. What does that have to do with white folks? Some things are none of your damn business. Nothing. It was a, it was a black on black thing, but you got other folks who will remain nameless working with, with, with for other networks with their irrelevant <laughs> ass selves, <laughs> popping their junk. Okay, and the fact of the matter is, it has absolutely positively nothing to do with that. It's about the fact that this situation end up looking the way that it looks optically, and now LeBron James is going to have to go out on that basketball court. With what you said, Shay Shay, knowing that J.J.'s got to walk into that locker room with what Udonis Haslam said in terms of, hey, when J.J. talks, you're going to have people raising that proverbial eyebrow, wondering whether it's coming from him or whether you it's coming from, from LeBron. The, yeah. All those things you're going to have to deal with. That's just the reality of the situation. And a lot. So mm. that's Stephen A. talking about Doug Gottlieb, who... Uh, Doug Gottlieb is white, but if he were black, Stephen A. and everybody would be talking about, he's made history. He's the first Division I basketball coach who also hosts a daily sports talk radio show. He's a historical figure. He's untouchable. He's a groundbreaker. He's this and that. But he's talking about Doug Gottlieb, who again, played college basketball. His dad was a legendary, I think, high school coach. Uh again, played against a lot of pros, covers basketball, knows a lot more about basketball than Stephen A. Smith. But because he's white, he needs to stay out of this. Steve, help me out here. How does, how can this be, a, how is this allowed at ESPN? This sort of racism. Well, that, yeah, well, that's kind of par for the course. Couple things. Uh, Doug Gottlieb, I don't think he ever hit 17 three-pointers in a row, but Stephen A. Smith did admit he's better at basketball than he is. So I will give Mr. Smith some credit for his honesty. A couple of things. I have a question. So Doug Gottlieb is a white guy, last I checked. Let's say he would have chimed in and said, you know what? I think Stephen A. Smith is right. A black coach is being aggrieved. It's unfair what they're doing to Darvin Ham. Would Stephen A. Smith would have said, excuse me, you're still a white guy. You don't have a right to speak out on black people's business. See, this is, and I see this all the time on Twitter. When you rip a fighter, the boxer will say, well, you never fought. Okay. I've never seen a boxer actually tell anybody, thank you for the praise, but here's the problem. Have you ever fought? It's hypocrisy. This is not about even a cultural <laughs> or racial issue in my view. It's just about, are you agreeing with me? The other thing is, uh, Stephen A. Smith, the way he talks like he's going to do something, if you ever saw footage of him trying to do boxing training, he should never raise his voice in anger. What is he going to do about it? And I get this all the time or sometimes. Steve, it's not something for you to speak about. You want to bet? 
either you believe in the First Amendment or you don't. And by the way, those very same people that draw these color lines in terms of subjects and what you can discuss, they break these lines all the time. A lot of these people spend an inordinate amount of words on other races and cultures. They are not even subject to the own rules that they lay down. I uh, just I was going to tell Steve I do think I've seen a clip of uh of Stephen A boxing. It's it's not the prettiest thing I've seen. So if you want to pick a fight with Stephen A you might be in pretty good shape. A couple of things. Um the the what does this have to do with white folks thing? This is the same argument they make for black on black crime. You're like, hey, we should probably do something. Let's make the neighborhood safer. What's that got to do with you? you? You just keep letting black folks kill black folks. It got nothing to do with you white people. It's the same thing we do with abortion. You let us keep killing black babies. Why, why would you make an argument against killing black babies? So nonsense. The other thing I would say is there's obviously a, um, a uh, double standard here because this is the argument Monica McNutt and all these women are telling him, hey, these are women's issues. Let women speak about the WNBA. And he sure stuck his neck out there with Shannon Sharp and the rest to keep talking about these women. So is it only a color thing? I don't know. It, it's, it's, I don't, I'm just trying to figure out why is he allowed to get away with it? There's no one at ESPN that could say, hey man, <laughs> we can't have a white person come on any of our shows and say, hey, black people stay out of it. <laughs> This is, this is a white issue. Step. It can't happen. So why is he allowed to do it? I, 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 I don't understand it. I mean, I understand uh, the politics and the dynamics of it and that we've created a system where, again, it's like black people can drop the N-word anytime, anyplace, anywhere, and we're all good with it. Black people can shoot and kill each other without ever anyone saying, I wonder if they hate black people. You know, because again, we're very comfortable. Someone can go on the air and say, you know what, Jason Whitlock is criticizing rap music. That means he hates black people. But if a black person shoots another black person, you can't say they hate black people. <laughs> this, I'm just, a, our brains have been twisted into pretzels playing the, some sort of racial game. I don't, who are the rule makers who comes up with this? What's the algorithm that explains why Stephen A. Smith, because they're talking about J.J. Reddick. He's white. Mm -hmm. And so now we're saying a white person can have no opinion on, on that? that can St Stephen A. and the, these guys uh, sitting on air joking about, talking about hockey. Mm -hmm. Stephen A., I think Shannon Sharp. Is it P.K. Subban or? or yeah, P.K. Subban, yeah. Yeah, they're sitting on the air talking, and P.K. actually, I guess, played uh, yeah. hockey. Played for the Preds here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but, but sh they can all talk about hockey, but Doug Gottlieb can have no opinion on something going on with J.J. Reddick and a conversation that, that they made racial? Well, Stephen A. is trying to actually inch Reddick out of it. He's tried to from the beginning. It's got nothing to do with Reddick. could have been anybody. I'm talking about how this related to how LeBron was affecting Darvin Ham. So forget the white guy. could have been a black guy or anybody else. It's the fact that he was putting his black coach in jeopardy. And you, you said, who makes the rules here? Well, these are the laws of intersectionality, right? And this is why Stephen A. actually gets put in a pretzel when he plays this card only when he can play this card and that's against white people because then you get into women and he has to shut up when it comes to women and then you get into gay people and then the women have to shut up because of the gay people and it's you got this hierarchy of victimhood and at the very top you have these black lesbian women you, you go down the list and they're the biggest victims in the world and they could say whatever they want and everybody else has to shut up so that's the law of intersectionality what what yeah, is keeping doug gottlieb black transgender woman go ahead go ahead steve <laughs> What's keeping Doug Gottlieb from saying, hey, you, you need to at least have average two points in Division One basketball to have an opinion on basketball if we're going to draw <laughs> these lines? I'm just saying, if we're going to have like this mark of like either you can, you're can you good enough or you're knowledgeable enough to speak about a subject, last I checked, Doug Gottlieb played Division One basketball. And there's actually like statistics and there's proof that he played. He was actually on TV, had a professional career overseas. The other thing is, if... Stephen A. Smith really wanted to make this a racial issue that I got to stand up for the brother man and not the other man. Shouldn't he be more upset that J.J. Reddick as a white guy was fast-tracked at his job and it was not a black coach? 
and that 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 and, the, and then he actually replaced a black coach. So he's not even being to me. It's just like it's not a big deal that Doug Gottlieb, as a third party, chimed in. I, look, everyone's allowed to have an opinion, and we're allowed to have opinion on your opinion. That's the way it works, right? But the fact that Stephen A. Smith, I think I saw a tweet where he was congratulating uh, J.J. Redick. I thought that was kind of gutless. I thought this was about this whole cultural movement that black coaches called you about what they were doing to a black coach. Okay, we'll go all the way then, Stephen A. Talk about what, why did they hire a white guy in this position? I, I think once again, he's taking the easy way out. All, all, none of these people want a fair meritocracy period end of story and so that handcuffs them as it relates to jj reddick they can't they don't want objective standards they can't say stephen a smith's not in position to say hey jj reddick is completely unqualified for this job he's he hasn't prepared to be a coach he just got a, a job being the number one broadcaster he didn't prepare for that he wasn't qualified for that. Because if Stephen A talked that bluntly and honestly, what he knows is that, because J.J. Reddick's no punk, J.J. Reddick will be like, oh, you want to talk about qualifications? You've written a book full of lies and fabrications that's been called out publicly, and you're calling yourself a journalist? I'm more qualified to be the Lakers head coach than you are to be seen as some type of journalist. J.J. Reddick is capable of stating that. And so that's why Stephen A. Smith can't talk. And again, it's like all of these DEI didn't earn it people, and they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. They all have to participate and pretend like they don't see the fraudulence in each other. Because once one person pulls into our fraudulence, eventually someone's like, oh, I got a mirror. Let me hold it up to you and show you how fraudulent you are. And so they're all doing a very dishonest dance and lie. And I'm, 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 I'm not saying that uh, people pre uh, previous generations never got undeserved jobs and positions, but it wasn't nearly as pervasive as it is now. The qualifications right now seem to be the, the, the lower your qualifications are, the more qualified you are for these positions. That's how a J.J. Reddick gets this job. He's standing on the shoulders of Stephen A. Smith, who's standing on the shoulders of, you know, <laughs> literally. They're all just building this fake world. And tomorrow, I'm pretty sure tomorrow, just to preview tomorrow's show, I think I'm going to get into... I watched this interview Deion Sanders did with Joel Klatt uh, this morning. And, and I'm just, I was watching it and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> just li Joel's asking questions and Deion's giving answers that are completely disconnected to the questions. But I, I don't want to give away tomorrow's show, but Deion's written, allegedly ha had some book written that he, it's his elevate and dominate it's his <laughs> philosophy on but but you can tell watching this interview like Dion didn't write this book mm -hmm. Joel's asking him questions directly out of the book Dion doesn't know how to respond and and I'm just I'm watching it and my eyes are just going like holy cow all of these people this is the blueprint let's write a book about some unqualified person and and use it to justify their qualifications to be in the position they're in where you're really right, because Stephen A. will actually come right up to that line and then use that point for his own gain. And what I mean is he made it very clear that Steve Nash did not deserve that New Jersey Nets job. And instead of saying, you didn't earn that, man. You've never been a coach at any level. You were an MVP. That doesn't make you qualify to be an NBA head coach. What's wrong with you? He didn't do that. He said, how come this never happens for black folks? So instead of using it, he goes right, he makes the point and it's an ancillary point, hey, he's really not qualified. And instead of making the point that everybody agrees with, he says, come on, black folks, we need to get in on this gravy train. That is the ultimate argument. Again, that's why I keep saying they don't want to fix anything. They don't want to end racism. They want to benefit from it. They don't want to end unfairness. They want to benefit from it. 
that, that everybody has been convinced, and I'm talking about black people, white people, I'm looking at Bill Belichick, just go through what we've been talking about today. People are just throwing up their hands and saying, look, it's over, we lost, it's a corrupt society, uh, there's no reason for me to hold myself to a standard. You know what, I'm 72, I wanna bang a 24 year old, I'm gonna let it rip. Bob Kraft would do it, Jerry Jones would do it, everybody else would do it, I'm gonna do it. No one, and th there are people, obviously, Joe Mazzulla is holding himself to a standard. Uh, uh, Harrison Bucker is holding himself to a standard. But more and more men are just sitting there saying, ain't nothing I can do about it. I might as well get my, jo my jollies off. I'm, what, what, what was Royce's deal? Uh, uh, get high and jerk off. Yeah, get, might as well get high and jerk off. That's what they all seem to be saying. Uh, Steve, are, are you still with us or are you getting high? And uh, Steve, you still there? No, oh, I'm just Steve. saying, man. Yeah. Final like thoughts, Steve. <laughs> yeah, Bill Belichick, man. Look, if Sharon Madonna can do it, you know what? Let old Billy Boy in on the action. I believe in gender equity. Shame on you guys. Seriously. Wow. Wow. That's the point. Man. I don't even know who you guys all are right. anymore. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. See you, Steve. Uh, that's all we got. Uh, is Tamara still here? Tamara was in studio. We could actually have Tamara sing Freedom on the way out. But did she leave? Yeah, no one's listening to me out there. Tamara left. Did Ren is Ren shaking his head? She left. Oh, yeah, we could have Tamara sing tomorrow, but maybe we'll do it tomorrow. No. Anyway, we'll see you tomorrow. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation. We all just wanna have freedom. Sitting on a corner, never been alone. I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back. We are receiving, all receiving. We all wanna be free. We want freedom. I just want, I wanna be, I just want, I wanna be, I just want, I wanna be, I just want.